Intelligent mirror on the wall, what's the best use case of them all? That is the topic of this 15 minute presentation where I will be talking about something called intelligent reflecting surfaces and its best use case. So this is a common situation in wireless communication where you have a base station that is trying to communicate with you as a user and the signal cannot reach them through a line of sight path because in this case there is a wall that is blocking and the walls might be removing uh, like 20 dB of the signal so only 1% is reaching you through the wall in addition to that there's much other losses so this is one of the causes of poor signal quality the good thing is that in general the signals can reach you for different paths so the signal might go through this window the problem is that it will then hit the wall and then it get reflected into the far right end here of the room as well so this is not really helping you to get good service but what if you at this point would put up an intelligent mirror something that we call an intelligent reflecting surface or IRS some people are also calling it a reconfigurable intelligent surface or software control meta surface so the idea here is to create some kind of virtual line of sight path through a mirror just as you can see something through a mirror so the signal is going from the base station, hits the surface, and the surface is configuring itself in such a way that the signal gets beamformed towards you as users. This is what is illustrated here. And we call it intelligent because we can real-time adapt how the surface is behaving. Reflecting because it's a reflection that we are controlling, and surface because it's a two-dimensional surface here consisting of small elements that we can control. So to understand how this intelligent beamform reflection is working, let's look at the basics of reflections. So normally when you have a flat surface like this, the signal comes in from a certain direction and it gets reflected in a predetermined direction. And the incident angle and the outgoing angle is the same, but it's just a different side of this normal that is pointing orthogonally to the surface. And if I'm here, this is my user device, well then this signal will not reach me. So what can I do? Well, mechanically, you could take this surface and you can bend it, so it becomes more like a parabolic surface. In that case, if you bend in the right way, you can focus a signal at the user device. And this is essentially what a satellite receiver is doing. It's a parabolic surface that is reflecting the signal from a satellite towards a particular point. The problem with this is that you need to bend the surface all the time, but mathematically what's really happening here is that you can look at your surface and you can divide it into small pieces, small elements, and each one of them gets a signal that comes from the right here, and they are reflecting it in such a way that it just throws out the signal in all directions. And then there's the constructive interference between all of these small components here that make sure that the signal is directed towards this device. And here the physical geometry of the, the surface is determining that. But in general, we can always apply this so-called Huygen-Fresnel principle to determine where will a particular surface reflect the signal. And what we can do is that we can keep the surface being flat, but we can change the properties of the surface instead of physically bending it. And the way of doing that is to change the surface impedance in such a way that we are getting a phase shift or delays that is uh, resembling what this bended surface is going to do. So if you want it to look bended, well then you need to introduce extra delays or phase shift in the center of it and not at the edges. And then you can achieve the same kind of things but with a flat intelligent reflecting surface. And the good thing now is that if the user is moving around, we can change these behaviors in order to always point the signal at the beam at the location of this receiver. So essentially, this surface here contains many small elements and the coloring here is showing how they are applying different phase shifts to the different uh, uh, elements in order to make sure that the combined effect of it is approximating a surface that is bended in a way that you want it to be and therefore be informed to signal in the direction where you want it to come. So this is a general concept and we can actually build these kind of things. So here is an example of that. So over here, we have a transmitter and there is a horn antenna that is very directive sending it in this direction. Here we have a baseline, a copper plate, that is 50 meters away. And then we have a receiver here. And the signal will typically be 
reflected just back in the same direction according to Snell's law. So if we are measuring the signal strength, we are operating here in the 5.8 GHz band, which is the Wi-Fi band. We're using 20 MHz of spectrum. And here are those 20 MHz. We can see that there is some signal here that is above the noise floor that we can see at other frequencies. But it's not very uh, visible here. But if we take this copper plate and we replace it with an intelligent reflecting surface, in this case with 1100 elements, and we configure it in the right way, we can make the signal reflected in to the RX antenna here instead. And when we are doing this in this paper, well, we are seeing we get the 27 dB stronger signal at the receiver than with this copper plate. So that is really demonstrating the benefit of using this intelligent reflecting surface and how an intelligent mirror can operate. The question is then, okay, if we can build something like this, what should we really use it for? And in order to understand that, we need to look at some other limitations of this technology. So first of all, how does an iris element phase shift the signal? The point here is that we have in this prototype uh, 20 rows and 55 columns and each of the elements can be viewed like this. There are some varied diodes and dielectric substrates and we can uh, put a particular bias voltage that we can use to change the reflection coefficient. Uh, so what is the amplitude and phase of the reflected signal compared to the uh, incoming signal? And depending on the bias voltage, we can achieve different things. So here we are focusing on the phase variations over different frequencies. And this is the frequency range that we are using. So if we have a zero volt uh, bias voltage, well, then the phase shift is like minus 120 degrees. And if we are changing it, we are progressively increasing the phase shifts up until we come to, say, plus 120 degrees. So by changing this bias voltage, we can achieve different phase shifts. And we should notice that the phase shift is roughly the same. I mean, it's a linear phase within our frequency range. So we can control it, but only assign one particular phase throughout our 20 megahertz of spectrum. But channels, propagation channels, can vary much more rapidly than that. And that is exposing one of the limitations of this technology. So let's look at that with the simulation example. We have an iris that is operating in a potentially frequency selective channel where the channel is varying rapidly over the frequency. We have a transmitter and a receiver. And direct path is 200 meters and there is a non-line of sight condition. So there is a number of different objects that reflect the signal in order for it to reach the receiver. And that also leads to a relatively weak channel. Then we have also a 200 meter channel from the transmitter to the iris. And it's either line of sight or non-line of sight. We will consider both scenarios. And then we have a line of sight component between the iris and the receiver. And uh, that is sort of, we deploy it so that the users are in that region. If we consider the case when we have a line of sight from the transmitter to the iris, so we have deployed it on purpose so that the transmitter sees the iris. Then here I'm showing the rate over the bandwidth. So if I increase the bandwidth, you see that the rate is going up. And there are three different curves. The upper one, the red one, is when we can, on every subcarrier of our multi-carrier system here, change the iris configuration as we like, which isn't really possible because we need to have the same phase shift on all of the different subcarriers. But then we get the red curve. If we have a more realistic case where we need to only pick one configuration at a time, well then we are making sure that we are taking the signal that comes from transmitted through the line of sight and we reflect that one towards the receiver. And then we get the black dashed line here. And we see that they are roughly the same. So we can get really good performance. And if we are chained an RS to a metal plate, then we are getting much lower performance. So it's really important here to have this intelligent uh, reflecting surface. But if we keep everything fixed except that we now block the line of sight path between the transmitter and iris, we instead get this result. You can see that the vertical range is much smaller because we get smaller numbers when the line of sight path is taken away. The upper bound is down here and the optimized iris case where we need to be optimizing it only one configuration not on a per subcarry basis, it's very close to the metal sheet. And that is because now the channel, it's varying so rapidly over the frequency domain that we can only adapt the iris to one of the subcarriers. 
and then for the other ones there will be fluctuations and eventually will not be much better than the metal sheet. So that is what explains this together with the worst propagation conditions. So the conclusion here is an IRS is only effective when you have a line of sight to the transmitter and to the receiver from the IRS point. What about the path between transmitter and receiver, which we call the direct path? Here is another simulation example of this. We have a fixed uh, quality of the channel from transmitter to the IRS and from the IRS to receiver. But we consider two cases for the direct path. One which is weak and one that is not strong, but it's equally strong as the path from transmitter to the IRS. And here I'm showing the capacity or rate that we get in megabit per second over one megahertz of spectrum. As I'm changing the number of elements that we have on this IRS from zero up to 200. And in case one, where we have a relatively weak path between transmitter and receiver, we can see that increase in number of IRS elements really makes a big difference. We go from almost no data rate up to a large number. While if we are in the case two, where the direct path is already not good, but it's relatively strong compared to the path here via the IRS, well then adding the IRS is not relatively speaking making a huge difference. And this is something we should also remember that an IRS is particularly helpful when the direct path is weak. We want to use it to extend coverage, not to provide better performance in cases where we already have coverage. Finally, configuring this IRS is something that is really complicated. Because the IRS is blind, we only see what is going through the mirror at the receiver point. So the way of figuring out how to reflect things is essentially to let the user device send a known pilot signal. We let the IRS reflect it in different manners, switch through different things. The transmitter is measuring what we are getting at the receiver side and it computes an estimate of the channel and then computes what would be a good IRS configuration. And depending on the propagation environment, these problems are much more complicated or easier to solve. So in a pure line of sight scenario, the signal that comes from the IRS have one azimuth and elevation angle and it should leave in another azimuth and elevation angle. So that we only need to figure out how to switch two different angles. And for that reason, we only need to estimate two parameters. While in a case where there is no structure whatsoever, rich scattering, well then we have n elements here and each of them will have a number of different channel taps that we are observing. So n times channel taps, this can be hundreds or thousands of parameters that need to be estimated, which makes it really complicated because we need to send a lot of pilot sequences here and try out many different configuration to get the sufficient statistics to estimate all of these parameters. So the conclusion is that highly structured channels are really desirable in order to be able to configure this IRS within a reasonable amount of time before the user have really moved on and want to transmit something else or have moved. And here is a recent publication where we are demonstrating how that can be done as well in a line of sight scenario by really exploiting this structure. So to summarize, what is the best use case of them all? Well, we talked about the direct path being strong or weak and the paths to and from the IRS being non-line of sight or both of them being line of sight. And in the case when we have non-line of sight path to or from or both of them to the IRS, then we have the problem that the IRS is not very effective because in an OFDM system with multiple subcarriers, we can only configure it to work well for a few of the subcarriers and not for the other ones. And it also becomes really complicated to estimate the channels because there will be a large number of parameters that are important. So it doesn't really matter what the direct path is. It still is not very effective. If we have a line of sight path to and from the IRS, well, if the direct path is also strong, the IRS is not adding so much extra power, relatively speaking, compared to the direct path. So it also doesn't really play a big uh, difference. So the really good use case is this. We have a weak direct path between the transmitter and the receiver and we put up the IRS on purpose so it sees both the transmitter and the receiver and then we can reflect the signal that comes from the line of sight path through the line of sight path the receiver create this virtual line of sight path and we have few parameters to estimate because there's only a few angles that are describing the line of sight path. So are there such use cases in reality? Certainly. So here's a scenario 
uh, this is a street a base station put so that it's covering one street here and we have buildings here that are just absorbing the signal for simplicity and we have two users at the neighboring street uh, that is perpendicular here and the signals are not reaching into that street so what can we do well at this point here for example we can put up an iris it's one meter by one meter and now we can see that the signals get reflected into a certain area so red color here means a channel gain that is relatively good and yellow means that there is a signal there but it's not that particularly strong. If we increase the size of the iris we can get this effect instead. A much stronger signal in this neighboring street and we now we are up at red colors and we also see that it is uh, very much more narrowly transmitted. So this is due to the effect that we have a hundred times larger surface so it captures 100 times more signal and it can also beamform the signal much more narrowly because it is larger. So here is one particular use case. And one can think about should the IRS really have to be intelligent in this case? Well, if you only want to reflect the signal into the entire street as when we had a one by one meter array, well then it doesn't need to be intelligent. We just fill the neighboring street with a little bit of power. But it, now when the beam forming is so narrow that it's only capturing one device at a time, we will have to make it intelligent so we can steer around the beam direction depending on where the user is, so we can also serve the green user. In addition to this kind of use case, which is the most promising one, one can figure out other kind of twist. For example, we can use the IRS to increase the channel rank, so we can transmit multiple signals through different objects in our propagation environment. Or we can use them to improve channel conditions in other ways to improve interference mitigation and both use MIMO scenarios, for example. But I think that this use case that I've been focusing on in this presentation is the most important one. If we can't get that one up and running, then all of these other ones that are more fancy and go into more deep details will not be very useful either. So if you would like to learn more about this topic, I have a number of other YouTube videos that you can watch as well. So here is a sample of those ones.